Hi everybody and welcome back to Miss Angler's biology class. I am Miss Angler. In today's video, we are going to touch on exactly why you never get a distinction in life sciences. Now, I'm going to break it down into some very simple components and easy things that you can do to really change how you study, what you focus on, and essentially what is the big thing that's missing from your work or how you're studying so that you can get that distinction that you deserve. Now, of course, preparing for final exams is a big deal and to make it just a little bit easier, I have written the cheat sheet study guides just for you out there who need help summarizing content, making um, ideas simpler and easy to understand, and also knowing what to expect in an exam. We cover grade 12, life sciences, physical sciences, mathematics, and accounting. We also do have life sciences in grade 10 and 11, and don't worry, we are adding more grades as we go along, so don't worry, grade 11s and 10s, you're coming up soon you're going to get your version very shortly. Now, the first thing we need to really focus in on is life sciences is all about terminology, okay? If we aren't using terminology correctly and we're not using it in the correct format, we're not going to get full marks. And let me explain myself very clearly on this one. If you are doing a past paper and you do the terminology section in the beginning and it's out of eight, if you're getting three out of eight, four out of eight, it probably is a good indicator of the overall percentage you're probably going to get for that exam. So that's an easy way, actually, and a quick way to know whether or not you're going to do well in this upcoming exam and whether or not you need to go back and kind of revisit what you've studied. So maybe what you can do right in the beginning of your preparations is do the little terminology section in the exam of a past paper and see how many you get. And that'll give you an indication of probably what you would get for your final exam. Now, how best do we actually tackle terminology? Well, essentially, terminology is learning and using things like flashcards. We could also use things like um, vocabulary lists. It really depends on the individual, but this is where it's really important. If you are going to use flashcards, which I think they are a fantastic recall and active recall tool to use when you study, make sure they are concise, but they are explaining two things at all times. Often flashcards made by other people are lacking one of the two, and this is what I mean. When we make flashcards, you need to make sure that there is the name of the structure, the thing you're describing, but you also need a point on the back of the card to describe its structure and also its function. A lot of flashcards only have one or the other and we often um, kind of overlook that and that's really problematic and that's probably also why the flashcards you are using are not delivering the results that you want. Now this next one should go without saying, but you need your exam guidelines. Everybody, if you are not using the exam guideline for the life sciences exam, you are already losing half of the battle. And let me tell you why. When they make the memos at the end of the year for those final exams, they use the exam guideline to tell them what they are or are not allowed to include in the memo. So that basically means if it's not in the guideline, it shouldn't be in the memo or for that matter, it shouldn't even be a question in the exam. So when we're preparing for our final exam, or any exam for that matter, we should be using the exam guideline. We're currently using the 2021, but as for my knowledge, it's probably going to come to an end now in 2024. And if you are watching this video beyond this year, make sure you are using the correct exam guideline. My suspicion is a new one is going to come out in 2025 that will keep us going all the way until probably 2030. They generally have a lifespan of around five years. But why is it also important to use your guideline besides telling you what to study? It is filled with perfect answers for questions. And I have included some here now alongside me of things that you should be only writing. If you want a distinction in life sciences, you need to be giving the exam guideline answer. So what does that mean? That means you need to be giving the transcription, the translation from 
the guidelines, so how they explain it. Another one that we don't learn very often, and that's probably why we're not getting uh, full marks or our distinction, is something like the out of Africa hypothesis. That is really, really important. And explaining how out of Africa works, it must come from the guideline word for word. Other examples of things from the guideline that you should know off by heart and that you shouldn't deviate from would be things like Mendel's laws, those should be word for word. And what's also really nice is there's some explanations on certain things like um, auto, uh, autosomal um, deficiencies or, or disorders, like for example, Down syndrome. How you're supposed to explain Down syndrome is actually in the guideline and you shouldn't be deviating from that. That is how you are going to get full marks by using the guideline. Now, the next thing is also not going to come too much of a surprise, and that is we don't know our question words. We don't understand the difference between the question words or actually like what, what do they want from us when we're trying to like explain ourselves in an exam. So here's the major difference. When we see an explain question, an explain question just requires a statement and a reason. Or another way to think of it is a cause and effect or a final way to think of it is what is happening and then why is it happening? Often these questions are out of two marks. However, sometimes they may be out of three. And in the case of three marks, you are giving one cause and two effects. That's how we get full marks. The other side of the coin is describe questions and describe requires way more detail. So often these are questions that are like six to eight marks long. Again, these are the questions that you probably will use your guideline to help you answer. And knowing the guidelines explanation will ensure that you get that full mark for your description. Now, I want to use an example because that's going to make this super easy to understand and so that you can kind of prepare for your exams coming up really well. The classic example I use because it's the easiest one to understand would be if I asked you, what is the difference between explain fertilization and describe fertilization? I'm hoping that you already know the difference, but if you don't, let me break it down very simply for you. If I say explain fertilization, I'm looking again, remember, for a statement and a reason or a cause and effect. So I would say something like this. I would say fertilization is when the nucleus of a egg cell and a sperm cell fuse together. That's my statement. Why? the reason, in order to produce a diploid zygote. And that's it. That's where we leave it. The two marks for your explain. But what happens if we need to do describe, right? Describe requires way more. So if we said describe fertilization, you need to be giving me how it's happening, where it's happening, when it's happening, and why it's happening. So there's a lot more detail. Now you can still use components of your original answer, but you actually have to give more. So let me explain and then give you the rest of the answer. So if I said describe fertilization, I would say something like this. I would go, fertilization is when the nucleus of the sperm cell fuses with the egg cell. This occurs in the fallopian tube and it is when the acrosome of the sperm cell fuses with the egg cell membrane uh, it, uh, the digestive enzymes um, digest the egg membrane, the nucleus goes into the egg cell, but only the head of the sperm, not the tail. And from there, the two nuclei fuse together, or the two, this is important terminology, haploid nuclei fuse together to make a diploid zygote. And you can see there's a big difference between those two answers. They have way more vocabulary in the described questions. And, of course, there's way more detail. And if that's one of the things that you are overlooking all the time, it circles back to my very first point. Terminology is king in life sciences for getting you a distinction. Now, if you've been following me for a long time, what I'm going to say next is not going to surprise you. But you need to be doing past papers, okay? And the thing is, when you do final, particularly metric exam past papers, the questions are not new. They're never going to be new, new. There's only so many ways that you can ask certain content. 
And so if you do enough past papers, you'll start to notice there's definitely a, a, a theme or a reoccurrence of, of a question over and over and over again. And so if you are preparing for your final matric exam right now, you probably shouldn't go back anyway four years because that's really all you need. And in those four years of past papers, you will probably notice, hey, I've kind of answered this question before again and again and again and again. And exposing yourself to it is really important because you also start to learn the memos. And please don't overlook the memos, everybody. They are vital to show you what kind of detail you should be giving. And you also kind of learn how examining ask questions because they use the same set of examiners um, in like five-year cycles and so that's why when you're and we're currently in a cycle now so it, a new one just started at the end of 2022 so we're in a new cycle now and that means that this new set of examiners you're getting to know them and so if you are going to be writing in this year I would practice last year's end of year paper I would also use the June supplementary paper and I would go a year further than that as well if you want to be super super prepared then do the last four years of the final papers and you'll be exposed to every possible question imaginable now this next one is a little bit nuanced it's a little bit different um, and the thing is as someone like myself who marks final matric papers I've noticed that when we do um, these final papers it seems as though candidates matriculants are not looking at the finer details in the question and I've just put up some examples here of questions where there was a fine detail that was overlooked and often it's things like was it a male or a female gamete? Was it a human or was it just a regular male gamete? Like, it's important. Is this a human gamete I'm looking at or is it not a human gamete? What was the chromosome number? Did they tell me the chromosome number or must, or is it a, is it a human chromosome number? And I think a lot of people and a lot of matriculants and also people in other grades as well, because this whole video is useful for everybody in every grade, is that we don't look at the specifics in the question. You read too quickly. And when they give you reading time at the beginning of your exam, you really actually, what you should be doing is not reading the questions. I tell my metrics not to focus their attention on the questions, but rather spend the 10 minutes reading the little blurb above the question and the diagram and sitting and looking at the diagram and labeling everything with their eyes quickly to see if they can label everything and identify what they're looking at. Because what you actually find is if you don't do that, what a lot of people do is they kind of skim read over that. They go, oh, okay, that's a, uh, that's a DNA replication okay fine 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 I know what that looks like and then they go down to the questions and then they miss a really important detail like they miss the detail that that's actually not DNA replication maybe um, that is uh, transcription and you've you've read too quickly and you've overlooked some very important detail so we don't want to be doing that of course another common overlook that I see is when we do um, specifically paper two, um, where we overlook mutations and we overlook um, meiosis a lot. And we don't follow the chromosome shapes, like was it a double chromosome? Was it a singular chromosome? And we look too quickly. And if it asks, you know, what phase of meiosis is this? You just quickly like splurt something out, but you actually haven't had the time or taken the time to carefully look through the diagram. So my suggestion is this. When your reading time is finished and you start on your first like diagrammed picture, I would reread it, the little blurb above the question. And then when you get to the diagram picture, don't read the questions. Resist the urge to read the questions and spend time labeling the diagram if their label's missing, making sure you know, okay, I know what that thing is. I know that's the ribosome. I know that that's an enzyme. I know that that's a mitochondria, whatever it is in the picture, and then read the questions. And what's going to pleasantly surprise you is you're going to go, oh, they want me to label the three things missing. Great, I've already done it. 
Oh, they want to know what process is in this picture and describe it for five marks. Great. I actually already identified the correct process from the very beginning. You don't feel flustered. You don't feel rushed. You don't feel like you've missed something. And often that is your biggest downfall. And then matrix want to go for remarks because they think oh, I wrote all the right answers. It's not possible. But in actual fact, the problem was they weren't writing the correct answer because they had missed a very important detail in the question and then there's no marks to find.